everybody. This is Elaine Kelly, and I want to welcome everybody to the Leesburg Public Library. I'm substituting for Deb Bussinger, who was not able to be here this afternoon. So Tom and I are back. We're the gruesome twosome, um, partners in crime, um, my wingman. And I uh, just want to welcome everybody here to Tom's presentation for the uh, Florida Cattle Guard. And uh, we do want to let you know that next month on July 1st, Tom will be having a second program. Um, and I, the name of it escapes me at this point. Tom, do you remember what the title was? Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're doing the Seminole War. That was it, correct. Correctly. Yes, July 1st and registration is open for that. Um, I do want to take a moment to thank everyone for um, being tolerant of our technical difficulties that we had last week and regrouping today. We do appreciate that. So with that said, Tom, I'm going to hand it over to you um, and go ahead and begin your presentation. Okay, I'm going to share the screen right now. All right, and start the slideshow. All right, I'm uh, calling this the Florida Cattle Guard today. I consider them the Confederacy supermarket. And, uh, you know, it's very hard to believe, especially in South Florida, that Florida was even in the, the war between the states. But uh, they really were, they actually were the third state to secede from the Union out of the 11 that did. And uh, as the war progressed, uh, even though they had the least population of uh, any of the states that seceded, somehow about 15,000 Florida men served the Confederacy in battle, and about 5,000 of them were known to, to have died. And that's sort of an approximate number because there's a lot of missing stuff here. Uh, like for instance, my great-great-grandfather he died in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I know what day he died in 1862. I have don't know what he died of, and I don't know what they did with his body. Uh, I'm presuming it was buried there, but there's a lot of missing holes, especially to, about Confederates in this war. So anyway, let's keep going. There we go. Well, okay, this is who they were. They were generally local militia. Most of the time they were too old or too young for military service. And, uh, you know, some of them uh, would go, uh, some of them were actually considered to be invalids. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the families allied with the holders was a family named Sap, and one of the Sap boys had uh, had his hand crushed in a sugar press and they concluded that he probably wasn't good enough for military service but he as long as he could ride and shoot with his other hand you know he, he could probably do anything so like i said sometimes they weren't suited for actual battle in georgia tennessee virginia but they could still contribute to the Confederate war effort. So let's go on with that. Now this kind of service they performed, they, uh, uh, barbed wire wasn't invented until the 1880s. So all the cattle in Florida were free range. And even today, cattle is still considered a major industry in this state. When I worked in Broward County, an entire community, Coral Springs, right uh, in western part of Broward, uh, the widow of a cattle baron sold the entire acreage for a million dollars in 1964 to developers to develop that whole section. And it's a considerable amount of land there. And uh, so anyway, they had to have people round up the cattle and assemble them together and do cattle drives like you see in the movies on Westerns. Well, they weren't all in the West. And this is why they had to do it uh, because uh, the union realized in order to win the war, they had to figure out a way to starve the Confederacy. And 
uh, General Winfield Scott invented what was called the Anaconda Plan. And this is a map drawn actually by the Park Service in the 1940s, showing you that they were aggressively going to build ships to inter uh, blockade all of the coasts of Florida and also all the rivers in the major rivers, especially the Mississippi. And uh, so it became increasingly important for the South to produce its, uh, its own food. Now, this is the way Florida did that. They, they processed fruits, vegetables, they made cane sugar and sea salt. And salt was essential because before refrigeration, the only way you could preserve meat were two ways to do it. You either smoked it or you salted it. And you could still get, you know, Virginia hams, traditional Virginia hams that are very salty, so salty, you literally have to soak them in water overnight or else you won't be able to eat it. And uh, now this picture is actually in from my county. This is the Yuli sugar mill and shows how extensive these things were. And uh, it was actually named for Yuli. He was our uh, first state senator. And uh, he actually built the railroad from Cedar Key to Jacksonville. And now it's the only railroad in North Florida. It was uh, for a time, it was the only railroad in Florida, period, because its railroad building phase with Henry Flagler and everything came after the war. And now it's another reason why these cattle drives were important because it was very hard to ship by them by rail. So they just had to be driven across uh, through the plains. And of course, she's going to say, well, where's Texas? <laughs> well, uh, before the war, uh, Texas provided a lot of beef for the South as well as Florida. And they had to be transshipped by barge across the Mississippi River and driven through all the states, Louisiana, Mississippi, up into Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, so uh, that, that was a very large part of the Confederate war effort. However, by 1863, the Union had gained control of the entire Mississippi River as I mentioned before. And uh, what they did is that there was no more Texas beef. So Florida became more important than ever. And this is what they had to do. They had the Flor uh, Florida had to supply this essential need. To, and not only did they feed the army, they also fed the civilian population as well. And uh, this is what the, the guard did. Now, they were mobilized, like I said, mostly from home guard units. Uh, someone in my family, my great grandfather, joined at the age of 18. And uh, that was the source of meat. And this is how many they were able to move. Uh, I found this uh, document from the Army War College uh, where some young uh, officer wrote about this whole phase. And just think, 2,000 head in, in one year, essentially that's 240,000 cattle. And uh, what's really interesting in his conclusions, this young officer said that uh, had the union been able to totally cut off this traffic, he estimated that the war would probably have ended in November of 1864 rather than April of 1865. But, you know, despite their efforts, they just didn't have enough resources to totally stop it. And Florida was the only Southern seceded state that still had a federal presence. Uh, even though they left Port, Port Pickens in Pensacola, they reoccupied it, even, uh, uh, they were able to reoccupy uh, uh, Fernandina's Fort Clinch, but the, and they never left Key West at all. 
but uh, anyway, this is what they were doing. And these were really rough, rough and uh, tough people. And uh, so anyway, they don't show it. These are pictures drawn by Frederick Remington after the war. And, uh, but this is basically how they looked. And uh, what they did is that uh, the reason uh, that set them apart was that they were using uh, whips instead of ropes to drive the cattle. And we'll go into that in, in, in a minute. And this, I found this reference to show you how difficult, the reason why they had to use the whips was that uh, the terrain, the scrub palm and palmetto and everything was so impassable that they, and the, they literally had to do something to get ar around that because, I mean, uh, a, a lariat was totally useless in that kind of terrain. And uh, so they had to go around it. And the, why, the reason why they call crackers is that the whip made a cracking sound when it sounded like a gun. And I know you can do that, and I'll tell you why, because um, my father was in World War II in Germany, and somehow he got stuck with minding these uh, two German shepherds that were trained by the Schutzstaffel. And the only thing that they were totally afraid of was a gunshot. And he actually had a whip just like that. You know, do he crack it? And they would, you know, Husan and Wolfgang, yes, we know their names. Husan and Wolfgang would, you know, behave. But anyway, let's get to the, the Comte de Castelnau. He, he was a French nobleman who had an interest in natural flora and fauna. He traveled to the United States. And uh, what he did is that this is a description he gave of a Florida railroad. And this takes a little explaining because railroads were sort of invented before locomotives. They actually were tracks pulled by animals. Those are the first railroads. And so this is a, the Count de Castelnau describes an early railroad trip 15 miles from Magnolia to Tallahassee in 1838. He said, the railroad is the worst that has been built in the entire world. And he goes on to say, but without its help, it would be almost impossible to take a heavy load of cotton across the sand. Now I interjected one bale of cotton is 480 pounds. Into, and he says, into which the horses sink at every step. He said, two mules hitched to carts and driven. And he's described that slaves went ahead of the mule driven train and held the loose ends of the rails together so the wheels wouldn't leave the track. So at the end of a staggering seven hour trip to go 15 miles, he wrote, one is inclined to admire the bold thought that inspired a project of such a sort in a country inhabited by hostile savages and through almost impassable forests, which so few years ago were not even explored by the whites. And in the 1850s, my family settled in Florida. They came from Georgia. And uh, I actually estimated that uh, it took them about maybe 30 days to travel. So, and most of it, of course, of how wild Florida was. And this is the kind of typical home they lived in when they got here. Uh, this is the traditional cracker house. It's in Bradenton. And uh, so you can actually go and see it. And it, is very reminiscent to me of my great aunt Edna's house in Gilchrist County. And uh, this is, this is uh, like I said, very simple living arrangements. It, it was really a tough time to live in Florida. Let's see. Okay, well, here's, here's a picture of Jacob Summerlin. He, was sort of this really wild guy. And uh, what he would do is that uh, he's posing with his cracker whip. 
and uh, said he and his partner smuggled beef and medicine to Confederate troops past the, the Union blockade and said with the, the money here, he bought a 160 acre uh, homestead and uh, much of it would be given to Polk County. And uh, so, and it's after the war when Confederate money became worthless, he began selling cattle to the Union soldiers at Fort Myers. So he was doing all right. <laughs> And this is uh, actually a, a, a historical plat that explains the reason for the dense underbrush that they had to navigate. Now, you know, uh, we tend to think that Florida did not have any major Civil War battles, but they did. Uh, the most famous one was the Battle of Olusty in Northern Florida, because one of the things they had is uh, there were a, a, a bunch of Union troops were still active in the state, like I said, from Fort Clinch. And uh, there were also many uh, Union loyalists in Florida. And uh, so they had a series of uh, engagement, most of them really on a fairly small uh, scale, but Alusty was a major battle. And on the right, is a contemporary print of a battle in Gainesville. So it was very, very hard fought uh, territory. And the stakes are very high. This is actually a letter you can actually read in the Florida archives. And it's from uh, the commissioners of Volusia County asking Governor Milton, the wartime governor for help. And uh, so this is what they said in this letter here. They said, the seacoast of our county and the other counties bordering and lying on the Atlantic are liable at any moment to be invaded by a hostile force or band of marauders who from the sparsely populated state of most of these counties near the coast would at any time be able to land and commit such acts of hostility and depredation as would in a short time drive them from their homes and render the inhabitants thereof utterly destitute or cause them to lose all of the fruits of many years labor and toil in industry. And by implication, not only were they talking about their homes and their farms, their fields, their crops, they were also talking about the herds because they also fit the people of Florida and they provided a source of income for them. And this is the aforementioned Fort Clinch, <laughs> Clinch I was telling you about. Uh, like I said, the Union lost control of it. They got it back. And they used it as a base to have a militia of their own, as well as regular troops, to go roaming the, all across northern Florida, trying to capture cattle, trying to engage with the cattle drive uh, men in order to absolutely try and annihilate them. Uh, I mean, that's how you stop the track. If there's no one to drive the cattle, the cattle doesn't get driven. And here's my ancestor. His name was William D. Holder. And uh, he was born in Dooley County, Georgia in 1846. Uh, according to him, he was born March 13th. And uh, Anyway, by 1852, the family resided in Levy County. He joined uh, Ludlow's company of Munderland's Cavalry in 1864 at the age of 18. And uh, a lot of people have asked me, why didn't he join the army fighting in Tennessee and Virginia and all those other places? And uh, I think he, like a lot of uh, people, didn't really want to leave home. And another consideration is that with the death of his father, whom I mentioned in 1862, uh, basically at 16, he sort of became the man of the family. And even though he had a stepmother and uh, an older sister, I think he made his decision that it'd be better if he stayed closer to home. <coughs> Pardon me. And, uh, and actually, a lot of men, uh, they didn't want to go 
any further than the railhead in Jacksonville. As soon as they dropped off the cattle, they were headed back. And actually, they were needed because one of the big preoccupations of the leaders like Mutterland was that Virginia, the government in Richmond, really didn't seem to take the situation as seriously in order to spare troops, although they did make it a gesture. They allowed some Florida troops to return in order to help with the cattle drives, but these were only short-term loans, and when they were called back to regular duty, they had to go. And actually, here's a remnant. Here's Ludlow's home in Cedar Key, and uh, you can actually go and see it today, and uh, it's actually the headquarters of the Cedar Key Historical Society. So you have a chance, and by Florida standards of the mid 1800s, this is a fairly substantial home. And here's William Daniel himself, a cousin. Her name actually was kind enough to let me use this. And uh, this uh, is uh, his wife, Josephine, who was born in Cedar Key. And Here's my great aunt Frida, I mean, great aunt Edna, her sister Frida. This is Preston. And this little boy is my grandfather, Delton. And this is a page from his, uh, you know, pension application. And it's really cool because you can actually go onto the Florida memory and you could read, print, and download the entire file, which is really cool. And uh, he had a lot of trouble. It took him nine years to get this pension. And uh, there was a lot of reason for the delay because all of the Confederate records were seized in Richmond and uh, transported to Washington. Actually, the only major Confederate records they missed was uh, Judah Benjamin actually burned all of the records relating to or their spy activities. So what kind of spying they were doing and sabotage, when and where, we really don't have information on that, but we do have these. And so he, it was just a delay. I mean, it was all done by regular post. And so he had to make an application in the county courthouse, which he did in Alachua. And uh, they sent and the, the, his paperwork to Washington and they checked the records and they found that there was absolutely no uh, a muster list for his unit that survived. And so they refused it. And then they made another appeal and they said that because there was no record, they concluded that he must have been a deserter. And so, I mean, the whole file is, you know, serious inquiries, you know, appeals, uh, letters from county commissioners showing support. And uh, I mean, it really was a real uh, hassle. In fact, actually, in the 1910 census, uh, W.D. was not living with his wife and, and two sons. And uh, there must, and I think one of the reasons was that maybe it, it helped make a case uh, for him uh, to get, uh, get the pension. So at, at Delton at the age of 10 was working in a box factory at the age of 10, 11. And uh, no one actually finally got him in. He had to supply affidavits from two men who were in the unit and they both testified that he definitely was a member of Ludlow's company. And uh, they said one of them described it as being quite a boy at the time he joined. So he finally gets his pension. It wasn't a lot, but it, by, uh, by standards of the day, I think it was something like maybe $150 a year, which was decent because he said he couldn't work. He had rheumatism, which actually is not a surprise seeing how many nights he spent out in, in driving the cattle. And uh, he also described, you know, it's like almost a TMI situation. He said one of his self uh, afflictions were piles. 
<laughs> you know, that's, that's, that was there. Uh, now here's a, another record. If you wanted to, uh, that actually you can find on family search, these are requests for tombstones, government tombstones for veterans, which, you know, goes on still today. If a veteran dies, they're entitled to a government stone and uh, shows you his, uh, his unit and where it was going to be delivered. He had to go, it had to go to Jennings Lake, which is uh, in uh, Gilchrist County, uh, a bit north of Bell. And at the top here is uh, what they call the Maltese Cross of the Confederacy. And it has his name, has his units, uh, and it says CSA. And this is really interesting because um, uh, things, even though the North and South tried to reconcile, one of the things that was a definite no on the part of most Northern Americans was to consider um, his service and their other service as eligible for a pension. So uh, no Confederate veteran got uh, a pension from the US government and no benefit to his widow or his orphan. Uh, so the individual states like the state of Florida actually did grant pe uh, these pensions out of state funds. And that's what that file you saw on the other slide was all about. And that's why they're all in Tallahassee. And uh, there's also a funny urban legend about this stone. It's always been widely believed, but it's not true, is that the reason why Confederate stones were not round at the top of rather pointed was that so a Yankee couldn't sit on their gravestone. But like I said, it's just a nice story, but it's not really true. And there is another family veteran. Uh, this is um, WD's older sister, Elizabeth Jane Holder, and that's her husband, Shadrick Sapp. Now Shadrick was regular army and according to his army record, he was granted furlough to go from Tennessee back to Florida and uh, to recover from something. They didn't specify what. And uh, so he did, but he found that he was unable to return because by then uh, the Union forces had gotten into Georgia and totally cut off access to Tennessee. And uh, he decided to stay and he eventually did join the same Ludlow's uh, uh, regiment. And uh, as before uh, with his soon to be brother-in-law because these two got married after the war in 1866. And uh, also uh, uh, one of Shadrick's brothers was uh, believed to be a deserter probably for the same reason because it was just impossible to travel. Now we have this book in the library and this is written by uh, Bobby Grenier. He's uh, Lake County's local historian and uh, it's called Central Florida Civil War Veterans. And actually the picture of WD and his family are actually in this book, uh, which I'm very proud. I mean, actually I had, there are several books in this library where my ancestors are in, you know, it's really crazy stuff. And what's really crazy is that I am a born and bred New Yorker. I mean, how does this happen? <laughs> Another good place to find out more about the cattle uh, guard is the Florida Memory Site. They have all of these pamphlets. They have a great one called Florida and the, the Civil War. Lots, lots of stuff. And this was, uh, this is Streety Parker of Bar, uh, Bartow and uh, he was in joint first Florida special cavalry. And this was the Munnerland's guard. So they were a pretty big unit. They were all over North Florida, central and north. Now there's a couple of good sites like on Roots Web. It's called, this is an article that was written by uh, uh, Paula Lanier Kelly. And it was, she was president at the time with the Margaret Mitchell chapter in West Palm Beach of the, and it was published in uh, UDC magazine and that's the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So this is from their January, 1991 issue, but 
It's also been posted in Roots Web, and it is a full treatment of uh, Florida fragments and the cow cavalry. That's another name for the cattle guard. Okay, and this is a really good, uh, I found this uh, also, and it's called uh, Florida's role in Civil War Supplier of the Confederacy. And it really goes in great depth. Like one of the things is that there was sort of a cattle type guard to drive the cattle to supply beef to the army as long ago as the Seminole Wars. So it, it, it was just simply revived uh, for the Civil War. And actually, I found this. This was published in the New York Times. Uh, and uh, it's, it's called Florida's Cattle Wars. I don't know if we own this book, but it, it, this was actually a book review. And I, and it, you know, maybe, well, I, I don't work for the library anymore, but, you know, maybe we can consider it at some point. And uh, so this is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of things you can find out about this. And there's even more places, believe it or not. There's a Florida Cracker <laughs> Trail, and that's them, floridacrackertrail.org. And this is one of the maps on the site. You can actually see, uh, along, they show you the road numbers. This is uh, 998, and it's going all the way across the state. So this is one of dozens of trails they also have uh, social networking pages. Uh, this is from Facebook. This is all about Munderland's Cattle Guard. Uh, this was published by uh, a son of Confederate uh, uh, veteran camp for Fort Christmas, which is in Orange County. And you could actually go and see a recreated Fort Christmas and learn more about pioneer life at that particular period. And uh, there's also other web pages. A lot of the, the people who are descended from these units like me have posted all sorts of information. So it's all, this stuff is all over the web. And there are monuments. This was erected in Plant City. Uh, it's the Plant City chapter 1931 of the UDC. And they did this in November 17, 2007, the same year this building opened. And uh, so this sort of explains the whole story of what they were doing. And uh, recognizing how important they were to Florida history, this is actually a painting that's in the state capitol in Tallahassee. And believe it or not, uh, there's even memorial <laughs> cattle drives. And uh, now I live in Citrus County, county just below us is Hernando, and Brooksville is less than 20 miles away from me. And uh, they actually have an annual cattle drive. And if you've got if you've got a horse and want to join it, you you can actually go. And uh, that's what they do. And they usually use it to benefit local charities. Uh, I think one of their latest ones is that there's a WPA built schoolhouse that in her uh, in Hernando uh, that was donated to Citrus County. And uh, so they actually made that a beneficiary. Now, of course, there are also novels about these people. And of course, the most famous one is The Land Remembered and The Yearling. Uh, th there's quite a few out there, though, because like one author I found who wrote a lot about pioneer Florida and these type of cattle drive people was uh, uh, an author named Lee Gramling. So I'm sure uh, you, you'll find them all over the place. But I re ho totally recommend both of these books. They're both really good books and really sort of get you into that world. And uh, this is Sons of Confederate Veterans. They, they actually have memorial musters. And one of the things they do is that they actually award uh, ROTC scholarships to young people for writing essays and everything about things like Florida history, the Civil War, the Cattle Guard. 
And that is the end. This is the 1861 Florida State flag. Now, I'm totally open to questions if you have any, but I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk and learn more about our shared Florida history. And uh, I am here for questions. Right now, everyone is muted at this point. So if you would like to ask Tom a question, all you have to do is just press your space bar to ask or say a, make a statement. And then when you release your space bar, you will be automatically remuted. Okay, thanks, Elaine. <laughs> Well, I don't see anything, Tom, nor do I see anything in our chat box of anybody posting any sort of statement. So with that, I do want to say thank you to everybody for attending. Um, again, Tom's next program will be on July 1st, and it's going to be the Florida Seminole Wars, and we hope to see you then. All right. Uh, just, uh, we'll see you then. I mean, that's an amazing chapter in Florida history. So thanks, everyone, for coming, and I really enjoyed presenting this.